Hello, and welcome to the Outcry Theatre Podcast. I'm Becca Johnson-Spinos, and I'm the Artistic Director of Outcry Theatre. Every episode of this podcast delves into the artistic process of creating theatre. Hi, this is Miss Becca, and I'm here with some of the actors from our production of Assassins. Would you guys like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Corbin Ross, and I will be playing John Wilkes Booth. Hi, I'm Peyton Nicholson, and I'm also playing John Wilkes Booth. Hi, I'm Isabella Wilson, and I'm playing the Balladeer. Hi, I'm Madeline Carter, and I am also playing the Balladeer. So we're going to start off with uh, talking a little bit about the show broadly. So tell me a little bit about Assassins. What's it all about? What's, what's the deal with this show? So Assassins is a Sondheim musical, which is not done that often, so I think it's really special that we're able to do it. But basically, the story follows all the different assassins that have tried to assassinate American presidents. And so you see from John Wilkes Booth to Lee Harvey Oswald, and you see, you see them all. And we also have these other characters who are the proprietor and the balladeer. And they're basically kind of showing the good side and the bad side of, like, America, really. And you get to see some really funny scenes and some also really emotional scenes. And it's filled with great music and it's amazing. In the New York Times on January 28th, 1991, critic Frank Rich said that Assassins is an anti-musical about anti-heroes. What do you think he meant and is he right? I mean, it's literally about people who killed good people. So I feel like saying an anti-hero would be a good way to put it. But as an anti-musical, I also feel that um, it makes sense because, you know, most musicals have a good ending, have a, have a, you know, happily ever after. But this one, sadly, doesn't have the same outcome. I'll put it that way. This musical is like nothing like you will expect it to be. And it's crazy. It goes everywhere. You go on such a journey in such a short amount of time. And so I think the fact that it's so different than everything else really backs up the anti-musical comment. The show is really different from most musicals, but I also think that even the way that um, Sondheim wrote the music, Miss Becca has mentioned before that um, the Ballad of Gateau is two almost completely different songs put into one song for this show. It's not just the way it is presented, it's everything about it, every technicality, everything. There are parts of the show where, like, you'll be watching it and sometimes you, like, forget it's a musical until a song comes on and you're like, oh, wait, this has music in it. Um, It's constantly shifting and changing and uh, I think it's just really, really genius um, how Sondheim wrote this. So you guys have sort of danced around this, but I want to talk more specifically um, about what's strange about the setting of the play and the structure and the tone of the piece. For like the setting of the musical, we have to be able to encapsulate all the different time periods of these assassins. So you could be hanging out in the barn with John Wilkes Booth and then all of a sudden you're with uh, Fromm and Moore and hanging out with some KFC chicken. And the setting is just so important because there's times where all the assassins are together in kind of this like limbo area. And so that's something that you just really have to like suspend your belief for a bit to really appreciate it. I also feel like the music in this show, like not one song matches another because of all the, the, the time periods we're in. Because, you know, John, John killed a president that was like 30 presidents before JFK. So there, it goes through a really long time. So, you know, Unworthy of Your Love is a very groovy, like great song. But then you get to what we did today, which was another national anthem. And it is absolutely nothing like any other song. So it's obviously put into thought on where we are and it completely changes the outlook on how we look at the setting and the story in those characters. In reality, this is kind of like a musical review. The scenes are vignettes, they're not connected in any way. There's not a through line of the story. And that's why it feels very jarring because we have this very, very serious scene followed by a very, very comedic scene, or sometimes we have songs that start very seriously and end up comedic and then go back to being serious again. It's really like a roller coaster of tones. The structure is also really weird because you have these long scenes of dialogue before you have any songs in them. Um, And there isn't the traditional kind of like 
we're going to build to a big climactic moment and then bring it all down because we actually have this huge like 25 minute long <laughs> dialogue only scene with no no uh, songs in it at all near the end of the piece which is normally when you would be wrapping everything up and we're introducing an entire a character who's not even in the play until the very very end so it's just a very strange little piece Tell me a little bit about your character and their part in the show. So Isabella and I play the balladeer, and obviously it's already different because the balladeer is um, usually portrayed by a man in um, the Broadway production. And um, I think that's really a really interesting choice because it gives such a contrast to the rest of the characters. The balladeer kind of represents the good side and looking on the bright side and being positive throughout everything. And kind of just the face of good throughout the play and um, the balladeer constantly is trying to um, tell the assassins that they can be better than they were yesterday and they don't have to do this even though the balladeer does know the outcome of every assassination obviously ends with killing the president but she just emphasizes that you have the power you have it in you to be better and do better and um, I think that's really important when you're watching this play because there's some really dark moments and watching all of these people who are crazy, to put it simply, it's hard to watch sometimes. And so you need a character who's going to balance out all of that craziness and bitterness and um, hardship. And the balladeer is that for you, kind of a fun, more um, narrator type, I'm going to tell you a story type character, which I love. The balladeer is um, kind of the human personification of the American dream, which obviously the musical is kind of all about how the American dream doesn't exist or the death of the American dream. And so having a character who kind of embodies that is really interesting to see in contrast to all these characters who are, like Madeline put it, insane. Um, and I really love the balladeer because um, she has so much depth and she has so many shifts in her character. Like one moment she'll be funny and witty and cheerful and the next she's really emotional and she really cares deeply about these people who are just crazy and have tried to kill or have succeeded in killing a president. I am playing John Wilkes Booth, and obviously the majority of the American population probably knows that name and is doesn't think good thoughts when they hear about him because obviously he is the man who killed Abraham Lincoln. And that's someone who a lot of Americans view as such a great president. And so having to play that character and have that character be such a big part of this show is really interesting because everyone's just going to automatically view him as like a terrible person. But in this show, it's written so beautifully that we get these moments where you really see him as like a person and someone who has emotions and who really is passionate about what he believes in. And I think even if what he believes in is not good, people can just like what they can take away is that you should be passionate about what you believe in and to constantly try your best. And he's always trying to get what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> Playing John Wilkes Booth also is a, a, a toll because we were taught that he was not the best person. So we have to also take our, our views and switch it. And it's an absolutely taxing thing, I will say. Because, like, you know, by the end of the rehearsal, we all leave a little bit different than the way we came in, but that's, what, that's the beauty of our characters is that with those, we can change, hopefully with the audience when they come in, they will also leave just a little bit different. How would you say we've changed the balladeer in our version of the show versus the way the balladeer is normally portrayed in the show? Well, obviously, the first big thing is that the balladeer is traditionally played by uh, a man, and we've changed her to uh, a girl and we've made her this uh, kind of cutesy uh, cowgirl uh, cheerful character and another thing that I think is really interesting is in the original production 
uh, they portray the balladeer as more of a like overseeing force and completely disconnected from the story mostly just a narrator and you don't really get to see his own like personal arc you just he just kind of narrates everything that's happening and it's kind of this overseeing disconnected force and in our production the balladeer is so much more invested in every single person and every single thing that happens and she really does believe um, that if these people try and they believe that they can really change and uh, try again and they can be different from who they were And she's so emotionally attached to these people who are terrible people. Um, But she believes in them and she wants them to try to be better. Uh, And she just has so much more emotion and she's so much more connected um, to the characters um, than in the original. And she has so much more of an arc than the original. And I think that's that's really cool how we've done that. Booth in in the show is the leader of the assassins uh, of the crew. Why do you think that Booth is the one who is the leader? And and I guess what what sort of does that mean for you in your portrayal of him and how it works throughout the show? So one thing that we know, we, we all know the name John Wilkes Booth. We all know who he is. We all know what he did. But we also have to realize he was the first person to ever uh, like successfully assassinate a president. And that is that is why I think um, John is is looked up to from the other assassins is he did something that has never happened before, but also angered the entire world along with him. So he was noticed, he was seen. I feel he put himself as the leader from the very beginning because he wanted other people to understand him. And that's how I see himself push the other assassins to do what they did. I think John Wilkes Booth is seen as the leader because he's someone who was so passionate about what he was going to do. He knew, he had lots of plans, like a failed attempt before, like he wanted this to happen. He wanted Abraham Lincoln gone. And I think just the passion that he has is something that all the other assassins can look up to and kind of take inspiration from. And we start the show you meet all the assassins and then John Wilkes Booth comes in and he's kind of just like seen as like this like God figure for all of them. And they all are like, oh, wow, here he is. Like, this is him. And I think that makes so much sense because he's someone who was so passionate about what he was going to do. And I mean, they're just all like, I want to be that passionate about what I'm doing. And so I think him being the leader is completely justified. Booth is actually the first assassin that gets his own moment in the show they're all in the opening number but then booth gets his his big scene is next why do you think sondheim and weidman chose to show this specific moment in booth's life and what effect does does his song and why we see him in this moment have on the audience versus seeing another point in his life the audience when they come to see this show like the assassin that they're probably going to be like the most familiar with is John Wilkes Booth. So I think putting him at the very beginning automatically is answering questions that the audience is going to have about like, oh, how are they going to portray such a terrible person? And I think by doing it, by doing it first, you're um, automatically going into his perspective and automatically going into his life. And you're actually going into him in his final moments. His scene is entirely taking place in the barn where he was while all these, um, uh, men are like outside with their guns all the troops are out there waiting for him because he escaped for two weeks and I think that's crazy but you're seeing him like at his like breaking point and um I think that's really special and really important for the audience to like kind of start with even though it's kind of like a jarring and like really emotional moment but just being able to start with someone who like they see as such a terrible person and kind of see him in like a very vulnerable way is a good way to start the show in the beginning of the song he's very Oh, I did the right thing. I did it all. And then and then near the end, he's just pleading for his life. And so I think the reason why they put him first was to show that, yes, they are bad people, but in this show, we're going to dive deeper into, into who they are. And so that's just an easier way to put, you know, get the audience attention. Yeah, you know, John, you know what he did, but let's get deeper into what he did. And that's why I think he's first. A B- Ballad of Booth was my number one stream song last year which is saying something because I listen to a lot of music. And um, I really wanted to do this show to do Ballad of Booth because for me, it is the exemplification of every single thing that you want to have happen in this show, 
which is you see this person that you have these negative feelings about because he did this thing that is so horrific. And yet in his song, Sondheim so beautifully crafts this passionate plea for him, whereas an audience member, you you feel him when he describes how awful it is to lose his friends in the war and how he feels like his way of life is slipping away and how how sad he is just about the way he feels like his country has changed in this time where 600,000 Americans have died. And so you see him being in this really tumultuous time in, in America. And then he has a moment where he goes too far and any sympathy that you had for him goes out the window because you you have this vile reaction to, to what he says. And it's such a crazy thing as an audience member to find yourself identifying with this person and then have them completely repel you. And then hopefully by the end, he's got you again, I think. I, I just think it's a really incredible, powerful piece. And it's actually one of the most serious moments in the show. And it's right at the very beginning. In a traditional musical, it would be the song right before the end. I mean, it, it's written to be a climactic. It's literally, you know, the last moments of his life, of the main character's life. And we're seeing it 15 minutes into the show. I just think it's such a powerful piece. And I'm really excited that I got to work on it and do it, even though it's extremely challenging for my actors to, to do. The difficulty of attaining the American dream has definitely been on my mind this year for obvious reasons. Um, I've really seen us grow more and more disenfranchised and fragmented as a country over the course of the year. As children in America, we're kind of taught that we can be whoever we want to be and achieve anything that we want to achieve, which usually the pinnacle of that is becoming the president. And, and the reality, as we all know, is quite a bit different than that. And the assassins in our story are told at the beginning by the proprietor who sells them their guns that they deserve a prize, that they can have anything they want. And then they can't understand why the world suddenly seems unfair to them and why it's turned against them. And so they lash out in anger and violence against this country that doesn't seem to want them anymore. How do you guys see the idea of the American dream reflected in the show? And what about the show brings that theme to the forefront. Obviously, the assassins, their American dream is going to be a lot different than like the average person. And at the end of our show, we get this number with the ensemble where it's called Something Just Broke. And it was added, actually, it wasn't like originally in the show, and it was added for the Broadway, uh, 2004 Broadway run. And I think it's really important to the show because all these horrible things have happened. You have watched these assassins commit the worst possible crime, and you get this moment of humanity, and the audience is able to see themselves. And um, being able to just like have this moment of like goodness and like raw motion to something that had horrible that happened, I think that's just really important to just like set the mood for like, well, these people, like their American dream is definitely not going to be the same as like what the assassins was. I actually feel a little different about how Peyton um, just put it. I feel that their American dream is the same. They feel that this country is, is for freedom, is, 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 this is for right and wrong. This is, this is where you come to have free thoughts, free speech. But then some of these people that, that we see, um, they look at the, their, their presidents and they see that they're taking away their American dream. And so instead of how I feel about this show and how this relates to the American dream is that these are the people who tried to do something about it. They did the wrong thing, of course, but it, it's more so of, I see this problem, how, you know, Jolgosh says the, the rich have too much power. And John says 600,000 people died and for what? Why did this start? Because you had your selfish reasons, and that is why I have to take you down. And so they see this amazing country and this, these amazing rights, and they see the American dream, but they see something blocking it. And then it's, it's, it's relevant to these days because we are seeing our country split apart, and we're seeing people try to do something about it, and all it's doing is pushing us further and further apart. 
And so we have to think, all right, so this is obviously the wrong thing. So what in these in this day and time is the right thing to do? So the balladeer starts by fully believing in this American dream. And then by the end of some of the songs, and especially by the end of the play, you really get to see her question, is the American dream real? Is this something that I can stand for after telling the stories of these people that did horrible things? But as we said, the balladeer sees what they're doing and not that she understands it, but she feels sympathy for these people and empathy for these people. And so getting to see her question it because of these people that she loves. She loves these people. And that she, why would she tell the story if she didn't love these people? So seeing them being crushed by their own dreams because that's what they think will get them to the American dream really makes her question the corruptness of society and how the American dream isn't just something that you can work hard for. And if you work hard enough, you can get it. It's something that is given to some people and is not given to others. I, I felt really called to do this show because of all the political tension that just seemed to be building uh, this year for all sorts of reasons about all sorts of crazy that's happening in, in America for from obviously dealing with a, a pandemic um, to a lot of uh, protests um, with the Black Lives Matter movement. And of course, an election year, we have a lot of stuff going on. But this show feels increasingly of the moment. Actually, we're actually taping this uh, the day after the right wing extremists stormed the Capitol to try and overturn the election results. Literally, it's the day after um, as we're sitting around this table talking to you. So our, our show really feels incredibly of the moment, even though it was written in 1991. What themes within the show or what about the show feels particularly relevant to you? And why do you think it's important for you as high school students to get the opportunity to tell this story, uh, to tackle this kind of material, even though it's mature and even though it's challenging? We are obviously minors right now, but someday we will be old enough to vote and to really have a voice and a say in what goes on in um, the government. And I think it's important that we're doing this show because we get to see a different view of America than what at least I was raised to think of it of. Again, going back to the American dream, you can be whatever you want to be, but getting to see these people struggle and these people think, well, I can't have that. I, I... I'm not allowed to have that because I'm poor or the president is in the way. Um, You get to see a completely different perspective that I don't ever get to see and that I never was brought up to see. And so getting to see that lets me be more educated on everything and lets me see the whole big picture versus just my tiny little mind that I had now just a little bit bigger because I'm doing this show. And I think now we're just like in a time where everyone just needs to learn from each other. I think no matter what side you're on, no matter what, everyone has something that they could learn. And I think this show really gets is going to get the audience to think. And I think there are people who are going to come and they're going to leave like change. They're going to like they may com- think a completely different way just because of this show. But and if they don't, you know, this show's still going to have them thinking and it's going to get them talking. And I think the show is really important, especially right now. I think talking and discussing the uncomfortable things is really important. And I think this show is what's going to start that. To, to me, this show is about about empathy, because as angry as I am <laughs> about <laughs> things um, happening in America right now, I think this show shows you the opposite perspective than what you have as a you know, red, white, and blue American, you see this person in John Wilkes Booth who is completely a representative of the racist American South that is the beginning of the roots of systemic racism that are still continuing today. And yet, because he is portrayed the way he is in this show, you have sympathy for him. You have empathy for him. And I think what the show is about is about trying to portray these people that generally would be seen as monsters, as full-blooded people. And that's shocking and difficult to deal with sometimes. But 
the only way that we can really move forward as a country is if we understand other people's perspectives and their points of view. Because right now we're so divided and so deeply at odds with each other that we really need to start to examine why other people feel the way they do to help move forward. And I think the show creates empathy, hopefully, even for our assassins. I think oftentimes when something terrible happens, we look at those, the people who did these things and we say, oh, well, they're crazy. So if we view these assassins as individual psychopaths, when we look at their actions, are we letting ourselves and our society off the hook by going, this is an isolated incident? And, and, and does this show suggest that there needs to be some sort of like widespread change to the way our society works uh, as a whole, I guess. I think that if we're viewing these really horrible people just as like crazy and kind of just like tossing it aside, I think it just neglects the fact that, I mean, they weren't the only bad people. Their ideas, I mean, a lot of times their ideas continue through history. You know, history is constantly repeating itself. And I think we can't just simply think, oh, well, only John Wilkes Booth was like this. Well, no, there's people who still probably think like he does. And I think by bringing awareness to that and being like, hey, these things are bad. Let's like discuss and let's learn and let's grow from these experiences that have happened before. Like, let's all sit down for a moment and kind of just like reflect on what we need to be doing. And I think that that's something that the show does that's really special. And I think it's really important. Like Peyton was saying, you know, we look at these people and we see, okay, John Wilkes Booth. He was crazy. He was a drunk. He was a, a jealous, jealous person. But really, he's he's the embodiment of everybody at that time. You know, every, at least everybody in the South. You know, everybody was saying Abraham Lincoln is is trying to take away the way we you know get our food. We you know the, the, these these things that we've lived with all our life are changing, and we need to do something about it right now. Everybody was saying that, but because John Wilkes Booth did it. He's the person who we look at as the person who did the wrong. You know, we look at the South and we're like, yeah, they were mad, but they didn't kill the president. John did. But John didn't just come up with that idea on his own. The entire, the entire society was saying, that man, that man needs to go down. So just because someone did it doesn't mean that they are the only person in the wrong. Like, like Spider-Man says, the guy in the chair, you know, he's still a part of it. He's still a part of the operation. He's, the, you know... People that didn't do it still contributed. And if you contributed, then you are in the wrong. And that is how I feel about it. I want to talk about guns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, hate, I hate guns. Uh, I feel very strongly about them. And I also hate them in plays. And I, 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 I had vowed I was not going to do a show with guns ever again. There are a lot of guns in this play. John Hinckley said, guns are neat little things, aren't they? They can kill extraordinary people with very little effort. How are guns portrayed in the show and used in the show? And how are they seen as a great equalizer of people and giver of power? I think a lot of people think that guns are really scary. And so the way that this show presents them is really interesting because it's not shown that way at all. I mean, sure, um, to the audience it will be scary, but to these assassins, the guns aren't scary at all. Guns give them the power and the strength that they didn't have on their own. They are their almost their safety blanket to compensate for the years that they have felt like they were less superior to those who were rich or those who were put in power when they could have been in power. And so with the gun, they can do whatever they want to do. They can kill extraordinary people, and that makes them feel bigger than what they thought themselves to be their entire lives. I feel like in society today, like growing up, I grew up with gun games, with with Call of Duty. Um, You know, you get get to go into a locker, choose your gun, go out and kill people, but at the the end of the day, you respawn. And and that's how I grew up in seeing it, but but even just, just in the show, you look at it and you see this tiny little pea shooter. Like a lot of our assassins don't have big guns. Like they are small. But that one thing, that tiny little bullet, ended a great person's life. And just, just not, I, our guns are not real. 
but they are replicas of what the actual people used. And so holding this this you know wooden base gun with met, with fancy metal around it that that you know that's basically John's gun, just holding it feels dangerous. It, it feels unsafe, and the the presence of ju- 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 just the gun in the room changes the the whole atmosphere. The gun song specifically is really interesting because it starts with a character who really, really hates guns. So that's Joel Gosh. He really hates the idea of guns, uh, and yet he is an assassin. Then we have Booth come in and talk about how great guns are because he's very manipulative and is trying to get Joel Gosh to kill the president, and so he is very um, smooth uh, with his description of how easy it is to use them. Then we have Gateau come in and talk about how great guns are in this incredibly silly, ridiculous way. And then we have Sarah Jane Moore come in and literally not even be able to find her gun in her handbag because it's so silly and wacky and goes off the rails. So it's this song that starts kind of like a serious discussion about weapons usage and then becomes this like absolutely ridiculous comic farce. Uh, And then it comes all back around in the end. But the genius of the show is that they're looking at these topics that are extremely, I guess, emotional and extremely difficult and tackling them from both a very serious perspective and also a very silly perspective. Sunday New York Times theater critic David Richards said that watching assassins is like receiving a death notice in the form of a singing telegram. Mm -hmm. What is the impact of hearing music which seems really fun and pleasant on the surface from characters whose thoughts are homicidal? This show, like the music in this show, there's a lot of bangers. (laughs) I have have to say, uh, basically when you know, when the balladeer comes on stage, you know it's gonna be a good song. And, I think just having music that on the outside is really just entertaining, I think that gets you hooked. And I think having the audience hooked on the song is going to have them start listening and focusing more. And there's a lot of lyrics in these songs that are like, oh, now that you're like saying it, like, okay. There's like, it's going to make the audience think. And I mean, The Ballad of Cholgosh is something that's like a big upbeat song, but they're talking about some serious topics and... Joel Gosh is about to shoot the president. So I think having the audience be hooked in and like totally focused on such like a good song, but also like understanding what's happening just makes it easier for the audience to understand. And I think that's going to help bridge the gap of like almost like being disconnected from these people and kind of just like bridge that like, oh, okay, I'm like understanding. And I think it's just going to give the audience a better idea of like how these people were thinking and what went down. The show is so uncomfy when you're watching it. You can never like settle in. It's constantly shifting tones and shifting themes. And it's so hard to like say, oh, which song's your favorite? Because they're all so different. And they all are so unique in their own way. And they all tell their own completely different story. For me, I think it's best summarized in the finale, which I guess this is a spoiler, but all these people's lives actually happened already, so you can just Google them on the internet. But we have finished all of our assassin stories, and then we hear this very, very jaunty music theater tune happen that feels like it's from like a chorus line or something. And John Wilkes Booth steps on stage and says, everybody's got the right to be happy with a big sort of smile on his face. And it, 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 wraps up this show (laughs) with this incredibly, um, I guess you would say, positive uh, song um, about killing the president. It's so discombobulating, as, as Izzy said, because you are finding yourself enjoying the music. You actually probably care about these characters to a certain degree, so you like en- enjoy seeing them. But the message that they're portraying, even with these positive lyrics, is so deeply unsettling. And it's such a great um, juxtaposition that I think is brilliant, and I think the show is brilliant. 
what has been you can choose either what has been either the biggest challenge or the biggest like pleasure of working on this show in our specific production getting to dig into the emotion and the character arc of who the balladeer is and not just the story they're telling who they are as a person is really interesting and it's actually been really hard for me because the lyrics that they sing are so presentational that they don't get the meat into who they are and I think getting to figure out who this person is while it has been the biggest challenge it has also been the biggest pleasure in playing this part because I've really gotten to um, establish this this arc that I'm really proud of, starting, like I said, with the big American dream, and then at the end, just feeling corrupt and hopeless and lost. And while trying to get the final chance, just being, just deciding I can't do it anymore because you're overpowered, number one. And deep down, she kind of knows they're right, that this American dream isn't real. The biggest challenge has been um, figuring out how to play this character in a way that is relatable to um, others and in a way that I will feel emotionally satisfied after playing this part. But that's also been the biggest joy in playing this part, and I really do love playing the balladeer. I think what's been the hardest for me is all the shifts and all the layers that she goes through constantly. The biggest example off the top of my head is probably Ballad of Booth. At one minute, she's like cheerful and happy and a oh, funny little song. And then the next minute, she's absolutely roasting this guy um, and like really just like raging at him. And then the next minute, she's like emotionally attached and sad and emotional. And as she's like listening to him uh, sing, singing and begging her to tell his story, you can see uh, all these uh, shifts happening and just trying to go big and really bring that and really convey that to an audience has been um, the biggest challenge for me. But it's also so much fun getting to really dive deep into this character who in other circumstances would have just been this detached force. Uh, and I love that we've done this to the Valadier because I love being able to explore all her different emotions and um, being able to bring all those to the show. For me, I think my biggest triumph of this show has not even been like revolving around myself, but just being able to see all these people in the cast like dive into these characters and really become their assassins. And I think it's been so fulfilling like for myself, and I'm sure it has been for everybody, just to see everyone like come together and like we're working in a pandemic. It, it's hard, it's difficult, and we're coming and we're getting together and we're telling these people's stories, whether good or bad. And I think the fact that we all are just dedicated enough and that we all are passionate enough to portray these characters in an honest and truthful way is really special. And I think that's been my favorite part of this process. So as an actor, I'm not the type of person who plays an antagonist. So coming into rehearsals one day and having to look at John Wilkes Booth look at the lines, some of the lines, I have to say, and look at a person that I am. I don't relate to this person at all. So from the very beginning, I have, I have nothing to pull from except for videos that I've seen. But I, you know, no actor just wants to copy someone else's character. So from, from, a, from a blank slate, I have nothing to pull. And as an actor, I feel like I have grown just coming from no experience in any of this person to still looking into the tiny depths of John Wilkes Booth's character and connecting and finally getting a grasp on who he is. But not only that, everybody had to do that. You know, you know, some of them, you know, no one just comes up and plays a dude who doesn't wear socks, wears pants that are too short for him and decides to join three Colts. You know, no one just plays that character. So everybody had to connect. And as, as, as a cast, we all helped each other get to that point. And so I, fe I truly feel there's not a single weak, weak link in this cast and that if anybody was anywhere different in where they are now, it would not be as pristine as it is at this very moment. And that is why I'm so thankful for Ms. Becca to put, give us this opportunity. All right, well, thank you guys for talking to me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for our latest episode of the Outcry Theatre podcast. You can find out more about this production at outcrytheater.com. That's theater with an R-E. This podcast has been produced by me, Becca Johnson-Spinos, and edited by Jason Johnson-Spinos. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your theater-loving friends.